organizing this morning to present our vision on peasant livestock and how can uh, animal production be developed on, in Europe. So we, we let the time for everybody to enter the, the, the webinar. And um, before we really start the conversation, the webinar, we wish to explain how you can listen to three languages as you have interpretation available in English, Spanish, and French. And you can see at the bottom line of your screen that there is a little globe with interpretation where you can choose your language. So the, the presentations will be in English or in French, so you can choose to be to have the translation in the language that you you, you prefer that you prefer. Donc pour la traduction uh, pour les participants, il y a une traduction en bas avec trois uh, langues possibles: le français, l'anglais, l'espagnol, qui vous permettent d'écouter ce webinar entre en, en trois langues. Euh, euh, donc bonjour à tous les participants. Good morning to all participants. And I will I will personally speak in English uh, during this presentation. The, the European Commission has set ambitious objectives with the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. Now it's time to implement it. And the question is how raising a strong debate, agriculture and livestock is often used as a scapegoat for, for it is representing 30% of greenhouse gas emission at the global level, 20% in Europe, with a large part attributed to ruminants. The industrialization of animal production has, is provoking criticisms from society while it is destroying uh, peasant farming and more traditional forms of, of small and medium scale farming. As ECVC, we consider that animals provide good quality food and that peasant agroecological production systems can have positive impacts on the environment and on the life of rural communities, uh, whether it is at social, economical and um, environmental level. So we recently produced a document which is a contribution to the debate on animal production. And we are happy to share it with you today and to have this discussion. It explains how to develop peasant livestock production and how to get away from further industrialization and concentration of production. So we will first listen to the presentation of the report by two members of the European Coordination Via Campesina and with Mr. Pierre Maison from the Alps in France and from Elisabeth Paul, who has free range pigs in Northern Italy in the middle of a mixed farming uh, system. Then we will listen to the reaction of Mr. Wolfgang Bircher, who is Director General of the DJ Agri. And thank you very much, Mr. Bircher, for accepting uh, our invitation to, the, to this discussion. Then we will have a first exchange with the public. And then we will have some highlights on the situation by three uh, speakers. So we will have Mrs. Stanka Becheva from Friend of the Earth Europe. So good morning, uh, Stanka. We will have Dr. Pablo Manzano, who is from the Iskerbark Research Fellow at the Basque Center for Climate Change and visiting researcher at the University of Helsinki. And Mrs. Anne Mote, uh, who is a um, livestock officer at the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Office of the United States. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And then we will open the discussion with the public uh, for a broader discussion. Uh, for the discussion, you are uh, asked to put your question on the Q&R uh, page, so you can uh, write your question. And uh, my colleague Emma will uh, try to send them, and uh, we will share the, the, the questions to the different participants so that you get uh, as many answers as possible. 
it is also possible for the people participating in the debate to to answer uh, in writing but um, there will be uh, the possibility to discussion um, so i think maybe just also to be um, to 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 open this discussion i would like to to remind that the european coordination via campesina is an organization of farmers of peasants small small care farmers and uh, agricultural workers uh, throughout europe so we have about uh, 30 organizations in 20 countries roughly and we are part of the broad organization via campesina which is a international peasant farmer of peasant farmers and farm workers organization uh, representing over 200, uh, 200 million people, farmers over the peasants over the, the world. So we are quite happy to be to be here and to have this discussion. So I will first uh, give the floor to Pierre Maison. Um, so from Confédération Paysanne in France, but also from the European Coordination via Campesina to explain uh, what is the situation of animal production in Europe now, and what is at stake uh, from your our perspective? Um, you have a bit less than 10 minutes, so I will uh, switch off my camera. And when I turn it on again, that means that you have about one minute left, and so it's time to wrap up uh, so that everybody can have about uh, the good, good time to present uh, his her presentation. So Pierre, uh, please take the floor and uh, and uh, hope everything is fine. And uh, so welcome to everybody. Bonjour à toutes et tous. Uh, merci Geneviève. Je, je vais vous uh, présenter. Uh, l'état des lieux un peu de l'élevage qui est, qui est en évolution permanente et les défis auxquels il, il, est, il, il, est, il faut s'attendre à ce niveau-là. Euh, donc, on assiste, on assiste à une hyper-concentration de, de, de la production animale et ça a été, depuis, ça a été longtemps, depuis longtemps organisé par les, les, les politiques publiques dont la... la, dont la la politique agricole commune. De, de plus en plus, les systèmes ont été, euh, ont été optimisés, rationalisés euh, et uniformisés dans des espaces restreints, euh, aussi bien l'alimentation, les soins, l'abattage. Euh, et euh, donc, on est parti, de, on s'est éloigné, euh, éloigné d'un travail avec la nature pour, par, par, par ce biais-là. Euh, next, la prochaine euh, diapo, s'il vous plaît. De, dès, euh, dès le début de l'après-guerre, bon, bien sûr, il y, avait une volonté, il y avait un besoin de nourrir la population. Il y a eu une approche très productiviste de l'agriculture avec des politiques libérales. Euh, on a assisté euh, euh, les, dès, so, dès 1962, en 1992, d'une réforme de la PAC et la libération, libéralisation des marchés. Euh, en 1995, euh, l'OMC euh, libéralise les marchés euh, au niveau international avec, avec des règles qui incluent l'alimentation. La, euh, donc, euh, se, se passe alors une course, euh, une course aux hectares. Euh, la, les, 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 les aides sont, sont, allées, sont bien sûr à l'hectare et pas, et pas plafonnées. Euh, la rentabilité, c'est un cercle vicieux. Quoi. Il faut... Il faut euh, une course à la rentabilité, à l'investissement. Et quand on investit, ben bien sûr, il faut rembourser les emprunts. Donc, euh, il faut toujours s'agrandir pour, euh, pour avec, et très souvent, les, les exploitations sont dans un système d'endettement per, euh, permanent. Et euh, de, de plus en plus, on, est, on a continué, euh, le, on a travaillé pour l'industrie, c'est-à-dire qu'il y a eu une perte de sens du travail parce qu'on a, on a fait de moins en moins de produits finis, de plus en plus de... De, de ce qu'on peut appeler des minerais pour l'agro-industrie. La, pour euh, et c'est une perte de valeur et de, de sens du travail aussi. Une prochaine, s'il vous plaît. Euh, alors là, à ce niveau-là, je vais essayer de, de, 
de différencier deux modèles, le modèle paysan, euh, qui, euh, qui, où il y a une recherche d'autonomie, de production de valeur ajoutée sur, sur des surfaces euh, limitées, euh, dans, aussi dans l'idée dans de, de maintenir du monde, de, de laisser de la place à d'autres. Euh, il y a un ancrage au, au, au territoire et on peut aussi innover pour préserver la nature. Et euh, l'idée, il, il, il y a une idée de, de pouvoir transmettre sa ferme euh, aux générations futures. Et en face de cela, on a le modèle paysan, le modèle industrialisé, pardon, la course, toujours la course au prix les plus bas, la compétitivité. On ne s'inquiète pas de la question sociale, du nombre de paysans. Ce n'est pas, le, pas la, la question qui est mise en avant. Dans l'internationalisation des échanges, ça, ça, ça s'articule autour de la dérégulation des marchés et une segmentation, une spécialisation de plus en plus l'intégration les, 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 aussi, mais de plus en plus les, 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 les productions sont faites dans des lieux, des lieux où il y, a des, il, y a des, il y a certains avantages. Par exemple, le, le, les, les, la production de porcs et de volailles, et surtout c est, c est les, les plus industrialisés sont, sont proches des porcs par, par rapport à l'importation la, à la, à la, des, des protéines puisque les, les, euh, les, protéines, euh, ont, ont été, les protéines ont pu rentrer en Europe dès, dès, euh, dès les, dès les années, dans les années 92 sans, sans, euh, sans taxes. Euh, et puis, on a aussi, euh, ben le, 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 il y a plus le, le territoire, c'est qu'un moyen de production, c est, c est plus, euh, il y a une déconnexion, il y a l'artificialisation, et aussi les pratiques dangereuses avec l'utilisation de plus en plus de pesticides et aussi d'engrais de, de, euh, de synthèse. Alors, ce que, ce que je voulais ajouter dans, ce, dans cette question, c'est qu'il n'y a pas... Il n'y a, a pas un, euh, un modèle paysan, euh, et puis, tout, puis un, dans, la, dans la réalité, sur le, il n'y a pas un modèle paysan et un modèle industriel, il y a plutôt un continuum entre les deux, entre les deux mais de plus en plus, il y a un glissement du modèle paysan vers le, vers le modèle industriel, à mesure que les, les, les petites exploitations s'arrêtent, soit en cours de carrière, mais aussi en fin de carrière, elles, 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 elles agrandissent les, les, les grandes exploitations qui, qui dérivent de plus en plus vers un modèle industriel. Et euh, l'autre point que je voulais souligner, euh, c'est que on n'a pas euh, le, le modèle industriel, il est, il est dans le sens-là, il est prédateur du modèle paysan, quoi, euh, parce qu'il a, il a tendance à s'accaparer les moyens de production, notamment les terres. Donc, il, a, il, il est... Il, Pousse à la, au, au, il pousse à l'arrêt la, du modèle paysan et c'est le modèle industriel qui, qui entraîne les, toujours les prix plus bas. Voilà, voilà prochain. Donc, les, les défis, maintenant on va passer les défis actuels. Donc, les, les, prix, les prix sont... Ils sont, ils sont déterminés par le marché, mais souvent par le marché mondial. Qui est, euh, ils ne permettent pas un revenu suffisant et stable. Et ce, ce revenu, ça, il faudrait qu'il y ait un revenu euh, plus, plus stable, c'est par rapport au renouvellement des générations, pour obtenir, euh, pour que, soit, pour que les, les jeunes veulent bien s'engager dans, 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 dans l'élevage. Le, le, dans euh, donc, on se rend compte qu'il le, 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 y a une transition qui est inévitable pour. Il faut aussi baisser les. les Enfin, baisser les fluctuations des coûts de production, on s'en rend compte en ce moment avec les, les prix de l'énergie et des, des, des céréales, avec les problèmes de spéculation sur les céréales, par exemple. Et puis, le, le, le problème de la production, elle est à la merci de l'exigence de l'industrie alimentaire. On est, le paysan, il n'est plus, euh, plus lui qui décide souvent euh, ce qu'il y a. Les, souvent, il y a, de il y a la, la production à l'intégrer. Ce n'est plus lui qui décide de, toujours de, de, de sa production, de comment l'amener. Il, il est juste là pour... Euh, pour euh, en subir les, 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 euh, les aléas. Et euh, on, dans, dans le sens-là, on a une perte drastique de, des fermes d'élevage, souvent les, les plus petites fermes, les, les, les fermes en, en, en polyculture élevage, et les fermes qui sont euh, les plus, euh, qui seraient, qu'on pourrait déterminer comme les plus résilientes en, en matière d'environnement de, et en matière par rapport au, au climat. Euh, 
donc la, la CAPA à du foncier, j'en avais parlé. Là, bon, la l'autre question qui pose, qui, qui est quand même un problème, c'est l'âge moyen, c'est la, la, la diminution du nombre de fermes et du nombre de paysans en élevage, qui est, qui est, c'est pas rien qu'en élevage, mais en élevage, elle est encore plus forte. Euh, pour donner quelques chiffres, euh, en Europe, euh, il y avait, euh, il y avait 10 millions, 9 millions de, de fermes éle en élevage en 2005, il y en a plus de 5,6 millions en 2016. Et sur, sur les, les, les paysans, il y en a 5,6% qui ont moins de 35 ans et 31% qui ont plus de 65 ans. Euh, prochaine. Alors, la question qui se pose, c'est qui va les remplacer si on veut continuer à. à qu'il y ait encore de l'élevage, qu'il soit. Euh, le, la question du changement climatique, évidemment, c'est quelque chose qui, qui, euh, qui on s'en rend compte de plus en plus, qui, qui, qui est présent. Euh, ça, 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 ça crée des problèmes euh, importants. Euh, L'été 2022 a été assez, euh, a été assez difficile en, dans, dans une bonne partie de l'Europe, notamment chez moi ici. Et on avait toute une période sans pâturage. Euh, après, euh, donc, il a fallu, euh, voilà, il faut trouver des solutions, il faut, il faut essayer de trouver, enfin, pour, pour, pour s'en sortir, et, mais ce n'est pas toujours simple. Euh, et c'est souvent les, les petites exploitations qui, en, dans, ce, dans le sens-là, qui, euh, qui, qui n'ont pas toujours les moyens de, de, de s'en sortir. Euh, le, dans le, alors que ces, ces petites exploitations sont, euh, sont les, celles qui, qui, ont le, qui, ont le, qui ont le moins d'impact sur le climat, qui, euh, qui ont le moins par rapport à, au modèle industrialisé. Par exemple, l'urgence, euh, se passer des engrais de synthèse et des pesticides, c'est euh, très possible en élevage avec l'utilisation des fertilisants. Euh, donc, euh, le... le c'est pour ça qu'il faut continuer à défendre l'élevage à petite, petite échelle et les systèmes polyculture élevage avec, euh, avec, euh, avec du pâturage. Ça, c'est possible, mais il faut, euh, il faut des politiques publiques, il faut une transition, il faut réaliser une transition dans ce sens-là. L'autre pense... question, ouais. okay. question qui, qui, est, qui aussi pose problème, qui, qui, qui est important, c'est le pastoralisme. On est, qui est de plus en plus confronté aux prédateurs. Et ça, c'est dans des régions, notamment près de chez moi, dans les montagnes, où, où euh, ce n'est pas possible de faire autre chose. Et le, le, beaucoup de, petit à petit, il y a beaucoup de, de personnes qui ne montent plus en estime l'été, qui préfèrent garder leurs animaux dans des, dans des bâtiments, dans la, la plaine. Et on va à contresens de ce qui est bon pour le climat et ce qui, dans, dans le sens-là. Euh, voilà, voilà pour le, la question du climat. Euh, les questions, euh, les défis aussi, c'est la question sanitaire. Euh, les, les abattoirs, de moins en moins d'abattoirs, alors que leur proximité est aussi une, une, une condition importante pour maintenir des petites fermes, parce que quand il faut faire des, quand il faut faire des distances énormes pour emmener un, un animal à l'abattoir, euh, c'est pour les, les gens qui veulent, qui veulent vendre directement leur production sur des marchés locaux ou à la ferme. C'est très compliqué. Pour retourner, il faut les emmener à l'abattoir, il faut retourner chercher, ça défraie et ça empêche aussi le, le développement de, 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 de petites fermes ou de, de, le maintien des petites fermes. Euh, il y a aussi les problèmes des normes sanitaires souvent élaborées pour l'industrie qui ne sont souvent pas adaptées aux producteurs. C'est notamment le cas dans les fermes qui veulent transformer faire, fabrique, en fabrication de fromagère directement sur la ferme. Les épidémies, euh, on a les. Dans les, dans les plus grands élevages, c est, c est, ils sont, il y a une concentration et les risques d'épidémie sont bien plus grands et ça nécessite plus d'antibiotiques, alors que les petits élevages, par exemple, sont, sont beaucoup plus résilients à ce niveau-là. On se rend compte la grippe, la grippe aviaire en France, avec la grippe aviaire en France que euh, ce sont, les, ce sont les, les gros élevages qui posent le plus de problèmes et, on, et, et, en même, et en même temps, on ne prend pas de mesures dans, pour, pour régler ce problème-là. Le seul, les seules mesures, souvent, les seules mesures qu'on qu prend, c'est les mesures qui, 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 en, 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 qui posent des problèmes à les élevages de plein air, puisqu'il faut enfermer tous les animaux. 
Euh, une autre question dans l'élevage actuellement, c'est la perte, de, la perte de, de, des races. Beaucoup de races sont, 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 plus, sont en effectif très réduit. Et, et à l'intérieur de ces races, souvent les races les plus utilisées, c'est la, la, la diversité génétique qui, qui, qui diminue beaucoup. Et, et des animaux qui ont peut-être sélectionné seulement sur leur production. Euh, et le, le, la question du... Il y a aussi la question du, euh, du, du, euh, du bien-être animal. Et on, on, le bien-être animal, il faut bien se rendre compte qu'il va avec le bien-être bien humain, ça c'est sûr aussi. Euh, et le, le, voilà. Pierre, oui. est-ce qu'on voilà. est, qu est arrivé au bout Presque, presque. Alors, euh, ah, on peut prochaine. aller un peu vite, ouais, vas-y. On va aller plus vite, oui, moi je suis peu... ouais, excuse-moi. <rire> euh, prochaine diapo. Donc, euh, l'idée de renforcer le type social, alors ça, c'est aussi, euh, aussi un, un enjeu très important parce que le, on, le, 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 le fossé se creuse entre la campagne et la ville, oui, parce que euh, l'élevage, c'est un métier exigeant. Et si on n'a pas de revenus, ben, il faut, faut tout faire soi-même. On, on peut moins être nombreux sur les fermes. Et euh, le, le, ça exige des... des, 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 des des temps de travaux importants qui sont, pour, par exemple, pour le lait, pour les traites et tout ça, qui font qu'on s'isole socialement et ce, le, ça, 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 pose des, ça pose aussi des problèmes, ça, ça rend le métier pas attrayant, bien sûr. Et euh, c'est bon, on, on, on a noté le cas du sursuicide paysan en France, mais c'est surtout c est, c est dans le, ce qui est plus élevé en, en élevage et surtout en production laitière. Prochaine diapo. Euh, donc, euh, bon, les petites et moyennes fermes d'élevage font vivre les campagnes, elles fournissent une alimentation de bonne qualité, elles sont plus résilientes et considérablement meilleures pour leur environnement et le climat. Comment les protéger Comment permettre aux plus grosses fermes d'entreprendre une transition Ça, c'est les questions euh, qu'on qu pose et les, je vais laisser la parole à Elisabeth pour, euh, pour nous faire part de nos propositions et en réponse à ces questions. Merci. Merci. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Pierre. Now, uh, Elisabeth, if you can start directly to the second part. A little 10 minutes, but uh, yes, can you respect 10 minutes? Thank you. I will be as brief as possible. Um, continuing in English. Um, so, Via Campesina thought about political solutions uh, to these problems. Um, one of the biggest ones is, of course, to support peasant farming as uh, as a first step to uh, to strengthen the pillar of our uh, sustainable transition and re-territorialization of livestock farming. So peasants play a big role in this. Um, also to give on their knowledge um, and have, at the same time, a significant reduction in the negative externalities linked to industrial livestock production uh, that will help to increase peasant farming and offer better quality products. Next slide, please. Um, I put together some of the proposals that we did. We, had, we, mentioned, uh, we mentioned in the position paper. Uh, they're just some, so um, please have a look in the paper later. Um, The CAP, as the CAP, has to include a plan for a very necessary structural adjustment, including, most importantly, gener generational renewal, which means new young farmers who have access to land. And uh, the CAP has to promote an agricultural farming, uh, farming types and particularly also mixed crops. Uh, we need to... Um, Um, subsidize criteria, uh, have subsidy criteria that will um, include, um, that will help with. Sorry, Elizabeth, it seems that you're. We lost, we lost you. Can you switch your microphone on again? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, good. Good. Go on, please. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Uh, we have. Um, We have to look at the uh, human and workers' rights um, during these changes because uh, shepherds, for example, are, one, are most often left behind uh, when they're working rights. And uh, we have to have a look within the European Union and the new protected designating uh, designation of origin 
and protected geographical indication labels. Um, the older ones, and then revision also uh, revision the older ones and have a have a very strong look on the new ones. Uh, so uh, it has to be taken, uh, the environmental impact of the livestock production methods have to be taken in account and we have to favor sustainable production systems and the respect of the working rights. Um, next slide, please. Another proposal that we have uh, for uh, changing the system at the moment is the collection and use of data. As we can see that uh, the European statistics that we see, for example, in the meat market observatory, for example, where I take part, is that um, the numbers that we're looking at is mainly imports, export, meat prices, um, and animal feed prices. And um, that is simply not enough. We should have a look also on types of farms, number of farms, development of the number of farms, numbers of slaughterhouses, size of farms per country, uh, number of farmers, and so on. So we actually need to broaden our, our, um, our view on how to measure and how to use the data that we're collecting uh, from, from the different farms within Europe. Uh, same goes for the civil dialogue group. Um, that we have actually um, have to have a, a good balance of uh, smaller, um, smaller and and larger lobbying groups uh, within within these meetings. Uh, I think a good, a very good example for this was the pigment reflection group that was held the last month, where um, they really tried to balance um, the um, contribution of the different groups within within the meetings. So one is about how to collect data and how to use and interpret the data within the meetings on a European level. Next slide, please. So we're talking about the re-territorialization of the livestock farming. Um, we uh, have to have a, co a coherence and a systemic approach uh, to ensure the highest possible environmental rules within our productions. Uh, we have several uh, proposals on this within the paper. Uh, one of the most important parts is also the hygiene regulations. Um, they must allow the existence of small and medium-sized farms food processing sites and slaughterhouses. Uh, that is one of the biggest burdens that we act actually have at the moment uh, as small scale producers, particularly also on food processing and slaughterhouses. Um, we have the uh, regulations on mobile slaughterhouses at the moment um, in the, uh, in the un uh, the question is really uncertain about how to move forward with a lot of small scale pro uh, projects uh, within several uh, European countries uh, on mobile slaughtering that would help a lot if we could if we, if we could move forward in this direction. And um, ECBC is thinking that we should um, um, yeah, prohibit or strictly regulate highly processed production of food. Um, food may need to get back to the basis. Next slide, please. There's always the argument of affordability. Yes, yes, this one. Um, food needs to be affordable for all citizens within the European Union. Um, the problem there is not the cost of food production, but rather, uh, as Vika Bettina thinks, uh, the cost of distribution and the cost of the whole chain. So by actually regulating to allow stable prices to cover the cost of the production and have a decent revenue for the producer, we need to make sure that um, the trans there is a certain transparency in the in the price um, in the price building uh, within the German distribution chain, so that we can see um, how how, um, how how prices actually uh, are are. Uh, are made and uh, and we can ensure the percentage of um, of uh, revenue for the farmers from the prices of their products. So um, uh, I have a number of the fifteen percent of uh, cost of food for in average in the French market, for example, of of a product that we buy in the supermarket. Fifteen percent is the cost of the of the food that is actually sold. So we have to think about how to. Um, make these price developments transparent and to um, 
ensure that there's a fair uh, share of the revenue uh, with the local farmer. Please, next slide. We further on have a, have a, had a look on the changing global trade policies. Uh, we actually think a lot about uh, animal feed imports, which are um, which pose a huge problem, uh, particularly uh, in for soy and corn, uh, which are usually genetically modified and. Uh, we should rather ensure local supply of fodder and cereals uh, for our production and go back to grassland feeding in, in order to get relatively self-efficient um, in the European Union. Further on, curb uh, unfair competition within Europe and use structural levers within the European Union to allow multiplication of short, chain, short supply change and on-farm processing practices. So this is one of the most important parts um, to get more support in this area um, to provide startup support for small uh, short supply change, um, to, uh, to have local support for these networks, direct support for these networks, and um, have small and easy grant applications. Um, that has to take place in a context of legislative framework for sustainable food systems. And as a last point, we firmly reject free trade agreements, particularly Mercosur, uh, which creates an unfair competition on a global level. I think these are the main aspects that I um, yeah, uh, draw out of the position papers. There are many more, so um, feel free to have a look on it. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. So thank you very much, Elizabeth. You you stick to the time uh, really great. So now um, you can you can see the front page of the publication of European Coordination via Campesina. So you can uh, you 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 can you are able to download it on on the website of the of of the ECVC, which is Eurovia.org. Uh, now I will turn to Mr. Burcher. So Mr. Wolfgang Bircher is the Director General of the DJ Agri. So please, um, if you want to feedback on what you've, you've, you've heard now about uh, this publication, our vision, it's quite summarized. So maybe it's not everything we would like to say. And then say what, what the vision of the European Commission on this topic. So thank you very much for having maybe 12, 15 minutes up to to your uh, possibilities. So thank you very much. Thanks to uh, European coordination of Via Campesina for inviting me to this event and many thanks to Elizabeth and Paul and also those who have been working on this uh, report on livestock. I think this report on, on future vision for livestock comes at a very pertinent moment. And I must say in many respect, uh, this uh, report speaks from my heart too. Because in many respects, I feel that uh, this report addresses the right topics and issues. And if I read uh, in your report that one of the key uh, elements which we are facing is the following. It is, as you write in your report, it is thus necessary to be particularly vigilant about data on livestock farming because you will analyze, we have painted a somewhat disturbing picture. Too often, little distinction is made between the different models and their functions and impacts when it comes to livestock. And I must say, I fully subscribe to this finding. Uh, recently, there was uh, another conference on livestock 
here in Brussels, where participants were complaining about the non-existence of a vision for livestock in Europe. And the sector is also considerably uh, scared because the two key elements that are uh, uh, making the life difficult for the life sector is the criticism regarding its environment, the climate footprint, but also the health issue, human health issues. So there are voices also here in Brussels who, if you talk about livestock, they just see it as a big contributor to methane emissions, carbon, nutrients, pesticides, all the evil that we know. And in addition, they feel, for example, eating red meat has a correlation with this cancer. So this is the vision of, of quite some people regarding livestock. And I think here your analysis kicks in. Too often, little distinction is made between the different forms of livestock but also, and I think that's a general play I have, the positive externalities of livestock. I just think it is not fair to reduce livestock to methane emissions and human health issues when livestock, in particular extensive livestock, produces all the other elements that you are describing in your conclusions. It's about our landscapes, about our grassland. Now I hear that people are complaining that 70% of our European agricultural land is used for feeding animals. And in this 70%, a big part is grassland. So what shall we do with this grassland than feeding animals? It keeps our land in a biodiverse manner. If it is done in a extensive manner, it contributes to carbon capturing. It's about the beauty of our landscape, but much more it is what you say here, providing stable and rewarding jobs, exchange of services, contributes to local identities, cultures, including culinary traditions. All this is also livestock. And I think I find sometimes, and I come back to my initial statement, that reducing uh, livestock just to uh, uh, methane emissions and health issues, which need to be addressed, uh, don't misunderstand me. These issues are hugely important to be addressed. And I think in many respects, we do it. So that is one of my uh, first statements. Secondly, and that is your key question, is, is there a distinction about the impact of small and medium-sized farms compared to what you call industrialized farms? Now, firstly, I think you know that, and our commissioner has ex expressed it at several occasions, he really deplores that farmers, the number of farmers are decreasing, 3 million over the last 10 years. And in particular, mixed farms are disappearing, which are the guarantees or the, the guarantee for having circular economy. So I think there is indeed a, an issue of small and medium-sized farmers. And I think on small and medium-sized farmers, there is also an issue to what extent are they producing in a sustainable manner, environmentally sustainable manner. Now, evidently, you find uh, uh, bad and good guys in all forms of agriculture. I think we need to be honest in this respect. But it's also true that small and medium-sized farms uh, contribute a lot to the diversity of landscapes, to biodiversity, and it's also a fact that small and medium-sized farms have high appreciation in society. And there is a big expectation also amongst citizens that they would like to have farms 
across the European Union, covering all agricultural land and all production uh, 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 forms in terms of livestock. And I think to a certain extent, it's true that that uh, uh, competitiveness and, and uh, uh, has led to a kind of situation where certain uh, forms of agricultural production take only place in very limited places. Now, I think you talk about also the industrialized production. And there I must say, I understand that you're talking about this. But I think we need also to be honest. When does this start? When is a production, industrialized production? And I just tell you, I've been in a farm in Austria over the summer. 18 milk cows dairy. The stable is completely digitalized. Uh, and I really feel in terms of animal welfare, in terms of cleanness of the place, in terms of uh, whatever you want, providing feed. This was a, for my perception, perfect place. But then I asked him, and, and what about your contribution to biodiversity? Because he did not uh, put his animals on pastures. But at least he argued the feed for this stuff here in this digitalized stable, which has also milk robot and all these things, the feed, the grass comes from my land, which I still cut. So what is wrong with such a farm? They play all the boxes in terms of uh, sustainability, animal welfare, because it was an open stable in the sense, not, not access to pastures as you have it in, 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 in organic uh, or agriculture but still the, 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 the animals are, are moving around. I do not go into details, but I just want to say, I think the issue is if you have uh, other farms that might be in compliance with all the rules, uh, I think it is difficult to start to argue when does this industrialized place start? Now, I think you're right to identify business models, and uh, Elizabeth has referred to them in the big reflection group, to business models which just do not have any longer societal acceptance. And in your paper, you are talking a lot of big farms, feedlots, close to ports, where uh, feed is imported from abroad and fed to animals. Uh, but quite frankly, do we support these farms in the common agricultural policy? If they have no land, do we support them? We do not support them. The big chicken farms, the big uh, uh, pig farms who have no land, we do not support them, maybe through investment aid here and there. So I think evidently there is also a challenge, not necessarily for the CAP, but for providing the uh, framework, the law framework for agricultural activities. And you know that in Europe, we are doing this now in the context of the farm to fork strategy. This is not an easy process. You know all this legislation about nature restoration, about emission directive, about pesticides directive, forthcoming legislation on animal welfare, on animal transport. So I think the points that you are addressing uh, are successively dealt with, but we have to recognize that in all kinds of transition and transformation, it depends on the depth of the change and the speed of the change as to whether you will succeed in a democratic process to get the majorities you need to get reforms through. So I think uh, the points that you are raising are really very important points. Another point which I really like very much is, is we are talking a lot about uh, um, short supply chains. But how can you have short supply chains if the infrastructure is not there anymore? If there are no slaughterhouses, 
So, so how looks a short supply chain with no slaughterhouses? So evidently, I think we need to look at these, at these kind of, of things. And I think somebody has been talking about mob mobile uh, slaughterhouses and so on. Then another topic that you're raising, and believe me, I, I know this very well because I've grown up on, on um, both my uncles were uh, mountain farmers, and this discussion on health, on health rules. Let's be honest, if something happens, if there is listeria, everybody cries. So every legislator in the world, be it at regional, local, or European Union level, goes for precaution. And this is what our society accept, expects. So we can deplore that you cannot use any more a wooden, uh, whatever, uh, uh, a dish to, to, serve, uh, to serve your cheese. I, 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 I completely share this feeling, but we are in, living in a world where everybody wants 100% security. And legislators, try to meet these expectations of society. So I think, I, I see your point, but I'm not sure that there are many concessions to be made on, on, on this question on hygiene and, and this kind of thing. So that is just some personal impressions uh, I have. But to conclude, I think the, 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 the conclusions or your recommendations, I really feel that the, the agriculture in Europe moves in that direction. If you look what happens now in certain countries, which exactly have had business models that were maybe not respecting the planetary boundaries or even the boundaries of the specific country in terms of environment and climate, there are huge discussion taking place. So I think the points that you're raising, they are uh, increasingly addressed. Now, <clears throat> What does the common agriculture policy do? And, and you see now that, that, uh, that uh, the strategic plans have been implemented. And as always in, in the reforms, some feel that we are not going far enough. Others feel that we are doing too much. I, I still feel that we are living, we are doing these things in a democratic process. And this is the best we got, we got out of it. Now we might still complain that pig farms get too much money. We have tried it. Commission has proposed uh, the capping. But I think on the other hand, we should not underestimate that we have no redistribution of payments. It's 4 billion a year that comes from bigger farms to smaller, medium-sized farms. This is not nothing. Okay, it's an, implement, an incremental improvement, but it is an improvement. The schemes that we have set up, or member states have set up for eco-schemes for agro-environmental measures, and our commissioner permanently refers to this, he feels that this, in, this is in particular an opportunity for small and medium-sized farmers. We have still left the possibility of, of coupled aid. I think that should also help in particular livestock farmers in, in, in the remote or in, in mountain areas. Uh, young generation is a key point that you have raised and Paul has raised where he rightly referred to the 57 years average age, which is almost unbelievable that we build our food security, that our food security is built on such a, 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 a age pyramid, in fact, that is quite scary. So indeed, I think we need to do a lot to, to get this uh, better. So again, I conclude, if you, if you agree, um, I really liked your report because he describes developments and solutions that I think we really have to address. One of your keywords, which I like very much, is the re-territorialization of livestock. I think that is an issue which we need to address, also in the context of the forthcoming protein strategy. The, 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 the criticism about uh, having uh, uh, huge amounts, in particular of our soya feed imported from third countries, is, is getting increasingly uh, difficult to, to, to uh, to, uh, um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to be against. And moreover, even in the European Union, I think we have to look at how we best use our agricultural land in terms of food and feed. But again, on food and feed, if some say that 70% of our land is used to produce feed, I am sad because feed for livestock 
leads to food, leads to milk, leads to butter, need, leads to, to meat. Now, evidently, we need to address the question of a right balance when it comes to vegetal versus uh, uh, animal proteins. But do as if feeding livestock is not providing food falls short in terms of argumentation. So I think, and here I come back to, to your point, and I think there we have many things in common. I plead really for a much more differentiated approach when it comes to livestock in a discussion that is very complex and not simple. Huh? And I think this discussion that livestock that is not sustainable any longer uh, needs to be discussed. But reflect one second also, what is really sustainable? This is one of my favorite topics because sometimes I feel that you can have livestock who produces a lot of biodiversity and carbon capturing, but it might be bad in terms of nitrate and methane emissions. Whereas you might have livestock who is in a stable, who is not good for biodiversity and, and, and for, uh, kept, uh, for biodiversity and animal welfare, but good for methane capturing and nitrate capturing. So who is now, who is now sustainable in all this discussion? Because sometimes even our uh, environmental climate biodiversity targets are to a certain extent conflictual amongst each other. So I think I stop here now. <laughs> Uh, no. Interested to hear the comments. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you've already risen a lot of issues that that uh, we wanted to to raise. Maybe maybe in the discussion. Um, maybe we have um, a little. Well, we have some questions or some remarks that I'm going to to read. As it, it it seems to be a simplest way. So the first one is about uh, in France we've lost eight hundred thousand cows in six years and so thousands of hectares of uh, of uh, grassland uh, or to the profit of uh, monoculture uh, with uh, pesticides but in the same time the european union is signing free trade agreements to import more more beef from new zealand isn't it a paradox so this is the first question and also to mr bircher um there, there was a report about the pig production, the pig meat reflection group. And she said it could have been written by the Copa Cogeca. It is a productivist report which ignores planetary boundaries. The report shared the intellectual fraud about biogas from industrial pig slurry, trying to make believe this would be sustainable through, though it is not. The argument of NGOs contributed are not even mentioned. The report suggests to take the cap money to save the industrial peak sector and continue to export. How will you improve the governance and when will you accept that livestock numbers must be reduced, reduced to adapt to pl planetary boundaries? Or is it, and it's only small scale farming which is able to do that. And I, I share the last question, so it's, it's I think it is more or less all addressed to the European Commission, but there will be more questions with our uh, speakers, I hope, at the end. So import, Europe imports 70%, 70% of all its soya bean, uh, most of it for intensive farming. That 30 million tons of soybean each year, creating a huge climate impact for European farming. How can we stop this model? So. If you can answer those questions, Mr. Bircher. Yes, uh, maybe I, I start with the easiest one, which is the reflection group. <laughs> this, this was not a report from the European Commission. This was a report also including Via Campesina. It was a consensus report on a huge number of participants with very different interests. And this is the report of the European Big Meat Reflection Group. So it's not a commission report. And I think so sometimes we need to accept that also other people have concern and want to raise their voices. And I think that is what it is about. 
there are parts of truth I feel everywhere. So I must say, I'm, I'm surprised by this comment because I think at the end, not everybody, my message is not that everybody has probably agreed with every paragraph in this, in this reflection group, but it reflects the different positions that were taken by different interest groups to a very difficult and complex topic. But these questions of business models and whether it's really the right thing to import huge amounts of soya from overseas to raise uh, a peak in Europe to the detriment of environment eventually and export it to China, I think that is addressed in this, in this recommendation, at least for those who are able to read between the lines. Maybe it was not uh, clear enough. So on the, on the, on the international side, Uh, I think uh, the discussion on 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 uh, animal welfare standards, which are the main uh, elements, in particular when it comes to imports of meat, um, and uh, the discussion that we should safeguard our frontiers or protect our frontiers against imports of products with lower quality, I'm not all. No, I'm not sure that this argument is pertinent if it comes to imports from countries like New Zealand, which have very extensive, as my understanding, grassland farming. But I still think there is an issue which we need to take serious, which is to argue that for methane or carbon uh, emissions and health issues, we should lower the European production, while at the same time, we are importing from abroad. Now, this question is also related to the future of consumer behavior. I think uh, those who argue along these lines, they have a point if it should turn out that the social behavior in terms of Eat meeting do not change. I think today, I think is about 50 50 or 58 to 42. The figures are different when it comes to animal proteins versus vegetal proteins. So, if Europeans continue to eat uh, uh, as much meat as they have done in the past, which is not necessarily the forecast of, of social behavior studies, then indeed we have an issue because we might import, uh, we might have a leakage and just to, uh, to place the problem in other parts of the world to meet our, our, our uh, meat consumption. But I think the understanding here is that behavioral change will occur and people will change their behavior. And, and quite frankly, sometimes it's also true to the messages that are given in social media and even in public television. I saw recently a, 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 a clip in a, in a public television of a member state where under the title, this is a science, a science, a science a, 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 how is it, production. The moderator said drinking a glass of milk is worse in climate terms than burning one liter of fuel. I mean, if these are the messages that are spread, uh, I'm not surprised that people might start to change their, their behavior. So, uh, so far to this question on, on, on uh, international uh, and the peak reflection group. Sorry, um, maybe I will give the floor to Elizabeth Paul, who was part of this reflection group, and I can give maybe an, a look on the, our point of view on this uh, on this report. Briefly, thank you, Elizabeth. She has a difficult job now. <laughs> I try to be um, <clears throat> a diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I was really surprised. The positive thing is I was really surprised that our um, that we could participate that much during the um, 
during the six meetings so that all the different um, coordination groups were actually asked to uh, to give their opinion to certain topics and uh, so uh, we were definitely part of the discussion but um, I was later a bit surprised that we were that um, some of the there was not only Via Campesina who, who brought the really like um, more towards organic and sustainable production method ideas within within the group, but um, that these these our our groups are not really represented within the more represented in the report. And um, but I I think there's a there's, there's a bit of way to go for this. But uh, I was already. Uh, quite happy that we have been asked for our opinion on this, and um, and yes, the most important uh, aspect that I see in these meetings is actually data collection and availability of data, so that we can actually argue with a very strong background in data. And I think that it can't be that can't be um, the task of only of the small scale um, organizations, but also from the European Union to to provide us with with stable data on on uh, on production types and and livelihoods which depend on these kind of production types. I think that's the next big step forward in these kind of meetings. Thank you very much. So I, I see Pablo Manzano has raised his hand, so I will give him the floor, and then I suggest because I see some other comments on the on the discussion pad that I suggest to keep your questions and remarks until the end there will be an open discussion and so we can move on to the presentations but Pablo please if you have just a feedback now rather short but you will have the floor then for your presentation but uh, please please have your okay, your okay. will I have the presentation right now it's my mm -hmm. turn no, yes. sorry. Ah, okay. it mean, you no, no, no. I just wanted to point out that a lot of the questions that are being raised right now, especially around numbers of herbivores that are natural and exceeding planetary boundaries and emissions on methane, I will tackle that in my presentation. So I just wanted to ask the audience to be patient, and okay. I think they would be uh, informed by what, what I will share. Okay, great. So the, the first person was supposed to be Stanka Becheva. So I will give her the floor, in fact, just now. So Stanka, if you are ready to do your presentation. Uh, so it's about the impacts of global trade on EU livestock farming. So Stanka, uh, the floor is yours. And like I said for the others, I will turn off my camera. And I was, when I appear again, it means that you have one minute left if you if you can. Uh, wrap up so but okay so now please go can people see my presentation yeah uh, yes yes perfect okay great um so my name is Tanka Bacheva um, I work for Friends of the Earth Europe uh, which we define ourselves as the one of the biggest grassroots environmental and social justice networks um so we have members in different European countries and um Livestock is an issue that we work on um, in, in different contexts in Brussels, but also national level. I've been asked now to talk about the impact of global trade um, on EU livestock farming, though we are working on many different other aspects. But I, I would also like to add or like to expand a little bit more on the impacts of trade, not only on European livestock, but also on the um, livestock farming in countries which are um, actually exporting to the European Union. Um, so just to start with uh, um, a very broad overview, we've talked, you've mentioned many of these things already in the previous presentations, but just to give an overview a little bit of um, international trade, this is a, a map of the five uh, top importers and exporters in the world. And you can see, again, that's been mentioned, many of these regions are big exporters and importers at the same time. So if you look at the European Union, um, in the black colors you will see um, is the exports and in the clear colors is imports. The European Union is um, exporting a lot of uh, chickens. Stanka, it yes. seems we cannot, uh, like it did not change slides. So no. probably you want to ah. move on. Yeah. You can see the second slide, the top five importers. No. It's still the title, it's still the first one. Ah. No, not on my ah, no, sorry. It seems no, I was seeing the map. map. Mm -hmm. I can't see the map. Sorry. Okay. Um, 
So, um, yeah, talking about Europe um, is a, a top importer and exporter at the same time. And uh, just to put things in uh, perspective, around 10% of um, annual global production is being traded across borders. And this has changed a lot in the last uh, 50, 60 years. At the moment, for example, beef is around 20% um, of the production being exported. And in the 60s, it was only 4%. And there are re different reasons for that, including different custom tariffs being abolished uh, within WTO, bilateral trade um, agreements and others. But um, just to uh, like put on the table, a lot of meat is already traded um, at the moment. And the expectation is that it will increase um, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming years. Um, that's the kind of the trend, uh, whereas it can be also influenced on the short, in a short period of time by different, um, different events, like for example, animal diseases or political pressure or sanitary restrictions. And if we look at one of the recent examples, maybe in 2019, China had African swine fever outbreak. This led to a lot of um, its pig, um, consumption um, meat coming from Brazil and from the European Union. So the European Union, for example, expanded its exports of pig up to like 15% more or less. Um, whereas the European Union is already actually a leading producer and trader in meat. If we look at, the, this is the last latest information I found from FO, Europe is the second biggest producing region and the third biggest um, region of, of trades in, in meat in the last years. But of course, this has consequences. And we started already talking about differentiating between different um, types of animal farming, though there are real problems and they need to be addressed. And I would like to look at actually what are the consequences and what are the problems. So if we look at Europe and what focus on exports does with uh, the countries which are focusing on this, um, I would like to look at Spain, which is um, one of the, it's the biggest, actually the biggest pig producer in the European Union and the third biggest in the world after China and the USA. Its pig production um, has been increasing in the last um, decades, in um, eight consecutive years, actually, and last year already with uh, more than 3%. Um, and the, the, the production has been concentrated in, in six provinces within Spain, whereas the slaughtering that's been talked about as well has been also concentrated in five provinces which are, uh, which are doing more or less, more than 50% of the slaughtering job. So um, uh, what have been the consequences for Spanish um, farming on this? This is the um, information I got from a report which was done by Food and Water Europe um, and our our Spanish colleagues, Amigos de la Tierra, they looked at um, the development of farms in Spain and, and the number of pigs. So you can see actually the number of pigs have increased in the last decades, whereas the number of farms have fallen down. This is not uh, an awkward change within the European Union because that's happening in almost all countries. But what can be observed in those regions where the increased pig production is happening, there is manure overload. And this leads to a lot of water supplies being actually polluted. And there is definitely a direct link between the number of pigs in certain area and elevated nitrate concentrations of, of drinking water. Another consequence, I mean, just, just to mention a few, there are even more, but is the use of antibiotics. Um, and the, pig, the, the Spanish pig industry is uh, one of the biggest uh, users of antimicrobials um, in the EU. And on the other side, we know that the antibiotic resistances cause um, tens thousands of deaths in Europe every year. So again, just to, to um, mention some of the problems that we are observing. And um, local population, fortunately, I must say, um, is not quiet about this. So you'll see in beginning mid of January, 120 locations, different villages and communities in Spain came together to protest against the expansion of pig production. 
Um, and here you can see different, the logos of different, um, different regions and different villages who are participating in that. And they're saying, we've been invaded by pigs. So this is, I think it's a problem which cannot be ignored. Well, this is a, uh, an example from Spain I'm giving, but we have similar examples from colleagues working in Northern Ireland, in Poland, in Denmark, where uh, big industrial um, animal factories are appearing and not serving at all the interests of the local population or, um, or the farmers. Okay, looking then at the um, imports, I said I want to look also at what happens when we are trading with partners who are exporting to us and we're importing from this. One example is the the Mercosur uh, countries. Um, so the EU is one of the, um, it has a, an important uh, trade partner, Mercosur states um, like Brazil, Argentina, Portugal, Uruguay, and already at around 70, 80% of all beef imports um, in the EU actually come from those countries. Um, the, the trade agreement between these two blocks is expected to be signed, or not signed, ratified um, actually very, um, very shortly, and if this would happen, this would mean that there will be increased imports uh, for beef, poultry, pork, soybeans, and other oil seeds. Um, what will be the consequences? Well, we know already that beef and soy uh, for export that's been mentioned in the presentation um, before are made dri main drivers of deforestation and biodiversity loss. They're causing climate change, water use, and water pollution. So also not serving actually the, lively, the, the local communities and disturbing the livelihoods of indigenous peoples um, in, in those re uh, regions. And impact assessments on the Mercosur trade deal are actually showing that there will be further social and environmental impacts um, in those countries, which will be similar to what we have seen um, already. Um, just to show you like you, you know, but uh, these countries are, have very rich biodiversity hotspots. Um, so the Amazon, I think, is, is known to everyone, but there is also the Cerrado, Savannah, the Gran, Ch the, the Gran Chaco dry forest and wetlands as well, who will be um, possibly impacted by, um, by this deal. So if the trade deals and the focus on trade uh, in meat is not is not profiting neither the local communities we saw or the, the producers, then who is it? Um, I'm just showing you a, um, a map that we did um, in a publication from last year with um, some of the biggest soy um, exporters and producers in um, the Mercosur region, so Marfrig, JBS, Kofco. Um, they're doing a lot of the, the meat and beef um, exports. And we see from the credits, from the investments that are going towards them from leading international and European banks like Santander, Rabobank, Barclays, and so on, that apparently those banks see a lot of profit in um, funding those, um, those actors. So um, the question is then if it's if it's not serving the interests of the farmers, um, as I said, who, who is this trade agreement actually, who are the trade agreements, um, whose interests are they serving? Um, a question maybe to respond in the, in the round afterwards. Um, but just to, to mention uh, very briefly, um, based on, on, on our analysis and on, on the work we're doing, we would agree totally with Via Campesina that we need a complete complete transformation of the animal farming sector and it definitely needs to be embedded into an agroecological moment um, uh, agroecological uh, food systems a uh, food systems approach um, and different policies can and should be actually changed to um, to make those impacts lesser um, maybe um, a question also to um, to the European Commission what will we need to do to actually um, restrict those, those problems? You spoke about the fact that there, uh, there's different types of farms. You yeah, completely agree with that, but um, are we implementing better environmental health, animal welfare legislations? Are we rethinking our um, EU Mercosur trade agreements? What are we doing to actually um, prevent those impacts of happening? 
Um, I will end with this. Um, these are the publications on which I based my presentation. I'm happy to share the presentation and also happy to take questions afterwards. Thanks a lot. I lost control on the on the microphone. So thank you very much, Stanka. Um, now we will turn without uh, transition to you, Pablo Manzano. Um, so if I stick to the title, you are going to explain uh, to talk about climate change, uh, carrying capacity of ecosystems and livestock farming. So the floor is yours for a bit, a bit well, 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. I hope you can hear me and you can see my screen. Perfect. Um, uh, I think in, in the discussion that we have had so far, we have seen that uh, both climate change and methane emissions and the carrying capacity of ecosystems to host livestock are two factors that are in the debate and that are very strongly in the debate. Uh, you all know about uh, the bad name of, uh, of livestock for climate change, but uh, sometimes uh, it's ignored that in the conventional metrics that are used uh, by IPCC and, and generally by the member states of the climate convention, uh, the grazing livestock, the ruminants, are mainly to blame because of how um, cellulose is decomposed and how methane is a, is a secondary product of, of this fermentation. And uh, most of the blame, most of the climatic blame is actually carried by small farmers. Uh, and this is something that is not very known by the general public, but if we use the, the climate metrics uh, as they are used now, uh, it is the, the small farmers that are blamed to be inefficient and that are blamed to produce most of the of the climate change associated to to livestock. And I think in in that sense, it's good that the report of uh, La Via Campesina has uh, reflected the new um, research that we are doing on that and what we published with Friends of Earth Spain a couple of years ago in in my team at the Bas Center for for Climate Change with Agustin del Prado. But uh, we have uh, some other um, publications that are worth mentioning now and some advances in our research. First, I wanted to frame the debate uh, showing that uh, grazing ecosystems are a reality in the world that look pretty similar. If we see the, the left panel, these are two protected areas, one in Spain, Cabanero National Park, and uh, one in Africa, uh, in Kenya, the Masai Mara ecosystem. They look pretty similar to what we call semi-natural landscapes, which are actually the same structure, the same vegetation, the same insects, the same plants, only non -man not maintained by wild herbivores but by domestic herbivores. And uh, maybe the, the word semi is, uh, is misleading in that sense. Uh, if we have a look at these natural grazing landscapes, they used to be maintained by mega herbivores that are largely gone uh, through uh, basically through the appearance of humans in, in those landscapes, except for Africa and South Asia, which are a, a great place to, to contrast hypotheses and to learn from them. And as we can see, there is a clear association of the arrival of Homo sapiens, of the modern humans, to those places and the disappearance of these uh, mega herbivores that were uh, doing a great ecological job. Uh, now, uh, what has happened is that when people arrived, these landscapes have been maintained first by hunter-gatherers and later by pastoralists, because both of them were very interested in creating pasture, because um, hunter-gatherers needed herbivores to feed on, and pastoralists also needed herbivores to feed on. So basically the mechanisms were the same, the landscape properties were the same, and the, and the results on biodiversity and ecosystem function were also very similar. And this has been well described by a South African ecologist called William Bond that has actually mapped those, those systems that were our complex landscapes. You can also see it in the cover of, on the book because we are not talking just about grasslands. We are talking about places that are composed of woody species, especially in the slopey areas 
and of grassy species in the in the even areas. And uh, this is basically controlled by climate. By it can be simplified by analyzing the mean annual precipitation and mean annual temperature of the places. So it's rainfall and uh, and temperature. But I, what I would like to highlight on this map is that places that we have assumed to be closed forests, like Central Europe, the Eastern United States, or Eastern China, are actually part and belonging to this type of ecosystems that do need fire and herbivores to, to be maintained open, just the same as uh, African or Latin American savannas. So we recently have published at, um, at NPG Biodiversity this study where we actually analyze with these optics of the, of the open ecosystems, how the densities of herbivores, the evidence for densities of, of herbivores behave. And we can see that high densities of herbivores are general in all of these um, open ecosystems with, uh, with evidences for uh, high densities of herbivores uh, from the same range as, for example, Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, in uh, Central Europe, in Eastern United States, in the prairie, and also in the, in the taiga boreal areas, which is a very interesting result. But I think uh, the, the most significant result of, of this research is that the perception that we have gotten that there is too much livestock that doesn't belong to these ecosystems is nuances or even rebated by the evidence that we have managed where the amount of livestock and the amount of um, of uh, wild herbivores is uh, is pretty much in the same order. We also have done this uh, popular science video here. You have the link where we describe this and, and other results that I am sharing here. So uh, basically, uh, we know that some livestock does very good and sometimes livestock does very bad to the to the environment and to the climate and to to things like that. And it's summarized in this FAO publication. And this has to do with something that uh, Mr. Butcher has has, uh, has shared of this uh, contribution to the to the ecology of this grazed ecosystem that justifies why it is so important from a biodiversity uh, point of view. However, uh, what has not been uh, reviewed in depth and what is, uh, I believe it can be really a change in perspective on how we perceive livestock ecosystems or grazed ecosystems is what the role is on climate. Uh, we first proposed this idea in this perspective in 2019, basically going from the same logic that I am describing here for biodiversity, uh, the methane emissions that are associated with grazing livestock would be equivalent, would be analogous to the ones that are taking place in natural grazed ecosystems, either by uh, wildebeest or by zebras or by elephants or also by termites. Just giving the example of these African savannas that have conserved all their animals. And to test this hypothesis, uh, we have done a, a series of studies. The first of, uh, of, uh, of them I am talking to talk about has been accepted this morning. So I'm pretty glad to, to confirm that this is accepted. Uh, where we compared the methane emissions from these wild areas and other nearby dominated uh, livestock dominated areas in, in Tanzania. Fortunately, we have the data for that. And what we found out and surprisingly in a place that conserves its guilt of, of herbivores is that the, that the emissions, that the methane emissions per hectare are basically the same. They, they vary very little between both systems, uh, which highlights that the, the problem, let's say the problem of uh, methane production in ecosystems in the world is not a question of having herbivores, be it wild or domestic. It's a question of having cellulose. It's a question of having grass, which is pretty good because otherwise we would be in Mars and that would not be nice. Now, uh, what happens in, in Europe? We also have done a study recently published at the International Journal of Life, Life Cycle Assessment. And I think here it's key to talk about mobility because there is a big difference uh, between uh, mobile systems that are more productive, that can use uh, ecosystem productivity much better, apart from giving great ecosystem services, and more sedentary farms that have higher 
uh, intensities of methane emission per product. And the reason why is because the, the mobile systems are more productive. They may be more expensive to maintain in terms of salaries, but uh, in uh, productivity per hectare, they are much more efficient and um, uh, they are also less, less methane emitting and, and better for the climate. It's interesting to compare it with uh, even intensive systems. We can see that there is a big difference in, in where the warming comes from. In transhuman systems, it mostly comes from methane, which, as I said, is a, a pretty uh, natural process. Whereas the more we intensify the production, here the example is for land production, the more it comes from CO2, from fossil CO2, that is not a biogenic process, and that is a legacy that we are going to let for thousands of years. But even more interesting, if we add the baseline perspective, so if we calculate how much um, wild herbivores would be emitting in these landscapes. And here it's different from the Serengeti because we have uh, systems that have lost their elephants, that have lost many of the migratory uh, herbivores. Yet, uh, we would have about 30% of these emissions in these transhuman systems that could be considered part of the natural baseline and therefore should not be considered as anthropogenic. They should be considered as natural. And then when we compare it with, with the other uh, production systems, we see that this 30%, uh, considering that without taking into account the baseline, uh, transhuman systems and intensive systems would admit roughly, uh, would cause roughly the same warming. If we subtract that 30% of baseline, uh, transhuman systems would be way more climate friendly than uh, what, what intensive systems are. And I believe this is a change of paradigm from what we have been hearing so far, where uh, extensive systems, grass-based systems, have been systematically identified as something that is more damaging to the climate. We don't need to compensate with the social benefits or with the biodiversity benefits, because we know that uh, they are also mastering uh, climate protection. And we have confirmed that also with uh, with another study that we have now under review at Landscape Ecology, where we have done uh, modeling analysis of herbivores at uh, at country level, where we confirmed this, this 30% of, uh, of baseline in, in Spain. Uh, linked, very important, to mobile systems, because mobility is a very important factor to explain this. Now, you will wonder what happens with the other 70%. Well, there is a large biomass that is consumed in the Serengeti, in the, in the African savannas that have a, a whole guild of herbivores, that is not consumed in Europe, and that will end up burning. And we know from this past summer how uh, but this has been, and this is not only going to get worse with, with climate change. Uh, just summarizing, I wanted to mention that uh, there are some papers suggesting that uh, we should plant many trees and just use land used by livestock to plant many trees. Uh, it's funny to see how it coincides with the distribution of these open landscapes. So it, it is really affecting the dynamics of these natural landscapes. But we should also wonder who wins with with these calculations. This text is state, taken from that from that paper. We see that they are talking about budget, about permissible CO2 emissions. Clearly, they are talking about how much money can oil companies, airlines, automobile industry, and other industries afford to still win while we are delaying the action on the real climate problem, which is fossil fuels, okay? And unfortunately, they use the trees in a way that we know from the little prints that can cause real problems and that we should act upon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. And, uh, and uh, I will uh, switch directly to Mrs. Anne Mote because uh, we are running short of time, but uh, there will be questions. Maybe we come back to you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Anne Mote? Uh, can you now please uh, uh, turn your uh, video so we can take talk about the importance of livestock for nutrition and the environment and its role in the agroecological transition? And maybe you can uh, explain to FAO and uh, also about a little. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I hope you can see my screen and I'm gonna move to presentation mode. Thank you for this invitation. Um, so so I'm, I'm gonna try and be short and, and give some facts and figures 
uh, but also maybe from from the perspective uh, of uh, not only Europe but the rest of the world, uh, and, and that's that's usually a role that uh, is expected also from from, from FAO. Um, so so and, and and I'm actually talking to you today from from Nairobi in Kenya, uh, where I'm on duty travel right now. So so sustainability uh, and those two topics of nutrition and environment they they actually part of of the a wider uh, agenda on sustainability, which uh, has to do with the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, as you can see here. Uh, but we usually also, uh, in FAO and, and our uh, partner organization, we usually summarize them um, in, in four main areas of work, uh, priority areas of work for livestock, food security and nutrition, livelihoods and economic growth, animal health, uh, human health, animal welfare, and climate and natural resources. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the, the, the red one and the gray one today. This is the, the focus that I was asked you to, to present. So uh, when it comes to food security and nutrition, uh, what we already know is that um, there are strong inequalities in food supply. So here you have the, um, uh, the supply of protein in terms of gram per person per day in different regions of the world. And you see that some regions are uh, way lower than, uh, than others, and some regions are actually lower than, than the um, nutritional requirements. Uh, so we, we usually say we need about 60 grams of, of protein per person per day. Uh, uh, in average, but this varies a lot uh, between men and women, uh, with your age, with your health status, uh, with your level of activity, and so on. And you, you can also see here the breakdown the, of where the protein are coming from. Uh, and you see that there's a lot of the protein that we consume in the world that's actually coming from plant products. So most diets are actually uh, plant-based already, but in some regions, uh, you have a, a, a higher contribution of animal products like milk or meat, uh, in blue and, and yellow. And in some regions, you see that it's very low and it's actually too low. And too low is because uh, when, you, you, when you look at some, for example, the, 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 uh, an indicator of, of hunger, which has to do with food security, so the global, the global hunger index on the left, uh, you see that countries where you have very high uh, occurrence of hunger, so this index is high, like Chad, Madagascar, Zambia, Yemen here, they're also countries where you have the lowest uh, level of consumption of animal protein per person. Uh, this is not a, a causality, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a correlation. That means those two uh, elements happen in the same country. Uh, so we have more hunger in countries where animal protein are consumed at the lowest. And then if you look at some indicator of malnutrition or nutrient deficiency, so for example, stunting, stunting is uh, when children are not growing as fast as they should. Uh, you see that, again, the countries where uh, the share of children affected by, by stunting, uh, and it's more than a third of the children in some countries, are also the countries where you have the lowest uh, consumption of meat per person. So again, a strong correlation. And why is that? It's it's because actually we we, we talk about food security, but not enough about nutrition. And and uh, animal products are actually very dense in nutrition, and they are key to closing the nutrition gap. And this is something that we have more and more evidence about. Uh, and I'm just presenting here some results from the Gain Alliance and, and Ty Bill, a researcher from, from, from the Gain Alliance um, on, on nutrition. And you see the share, the, sorry, the size of uh, different types of food in this graph to cover a third of requirements in iron, in vitamin A, in zinc, in calcium, etc. So you see that uh, some animal products like beef liver, but also uh, beef meat, uh, eggs, uh, chicken, but also dark leafy greens like, like spinach, um, you, you, they, they're quite dense. So they need uh, we need smaller portions to cover a third of our requirements. Uh, on the contrary, if you look at groundnuts or pulses, the size of a portion to cover those requirements is way bigger. So that doesn't mean we need to eat only beef liver. It means that having some beef liver in the, in the diet contributes to uh, uh, closing the nutrition gap. And I see, uh, I, I showed here uh, some, some example of studies um, that look into the impact of improving livestock production. For example, here, vaccination uh, of, of chicken against Newcastle disease and how this results uh, in uh, better nutrition um, uh, for children. So now if we move to the other area of work that is uh, environment and climate change, um, I just wanted to uh, take a step back here and, and, and let's say we, uh, we all want to be, uh, how we say now, Paris uh, compliant, Paris Agreement compliant. So that means 
we need to reduce our uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, so let's say we have a limited budget of CO2 to, to, to spend. Um, and I'm just comparing here uh, what we get from a ton of carbon uh, in terms, for example, of value. Uh, you see on the left uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, USD per ton of carbon uh, equivalent. In agriculture, uh, we don't get a lot of value uh, out of the emissions coming from agriculture. You see, you get way more value and dollars if you spend your carbon in industry or services, uh, the gray bar. But then if we move to jobs, uh, you actually generate twice as many jobs per ton of carbon if you invest your carbon in agriculture. So that means per ton of carbon uh, from the agricultural sector, uh, we have twice as many jobs compared to industrial services. And of course, if you move to kilocalories like food or um, protein for nutrition, uh, then you see the, the industry and services don't, don't produce any food. So that's where, where you get uh, your benefit in terms of food security, nutrition, per tons of carbon. Um, so a, a, another point that we have to, to look into when it comes to the environment, uh, now that we, we, we looked at nutrition, um, is the competition between feed and food. And I think Pablo already uh, mentioned that, but we, we, we have this global assessment uh, of how, what, what is consumed by the, by the global livestock sector in terms of feed. And you see, we have lots of grass, lots of crop residues, lots of all seed cakes, uh, and we have a share of cereals. Um, so it's not a lot compared to the global ration of, of the animals, but it is uh, actually uh, about a third of global cereals that are consumed in, for livestock feed. So that, that shows that first, uh, we do have some form of competition, but second, we have options to replace that by all these other sources that are already consumed and that are becoming more and more available, uh, crop residues, uh, all seed cakes, uh, waste from the agri-food industry. Uh, as our processing of uh, and uh, in our food system is growing. And so the, the solution lies in, in replacing uh, as much as possible uh, the feed that are in competition with food um, uh, by uh, feed that are not. So to summarize, um, and this is coming from, from a paper that we just uh, published in the Journal of Nutrition, um, it's so the, the when, when you look at the environmental impact of, of uh, the livestock sector or agriculture in general, uh, you can look into those five main areas biodiversity, water, land use, soils, and climate change. And you see that for all of those uh, boxes, the, all of those areas, you have uh, positive and negative impacts from the sector. But what we try also to show in this graphic is that by increasing what we now refer to as circularity, uh, we can reduce the negative impact and increase the positive impact. So, for example, this has to do with recycling residues and byproducts as animal feed instead of feeding uh, cereals, for example. Uh, it has to do with also recovering the nutrient, the water, and the organic matter uh, from manure. Uh, so, for example, to fertilize crop feed, but also to generate uh, energy with uh, anaerobic digestion or biogas. Um, and uh, if we're not circular, uh, what results from this is that actually all those, those elements are losses and waste from, uh, uh, from our food systems that accumulate uh, and that we don't take advantage of. Uh, so that, that's the, the, the paper I was mentioning, uh, if, if you're interested in looking at the nutrition and environmental aspects summarizing this review. And now to finish, um, I, I'd like to mention uh, something that already came up uh, a few times in the discussion, uh, agroecology as an approach uh, to make our food systems more sustainable. Um, here are the results. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not expecting you to look into all the details, but it's just to show you uh, the level of data we can collect uh, with uh, the tool for agroecology performance evaluation or TAPE uh, that we developed in FAO uh, with a lot of partners and that we have applied now in about 40 countries. Um, and when we look at uh, livestock in this big global database of performance of different systems, we see that uh, the only viable in our database in you know, 5,000 farms uh, across the world that have a negative correlation with the score of agroecology is the absence of animals. So basically, uh, in our database, we, we the farms that uh, have no livestock are the ones that are the least agroecological, the, less, the least advanced uh, over uh, what we uh, call the 10 elements of agroecology, which is the framework that uh, FAO is using and has been validated by uh, member nations.
And, and the conclusion from, from, from looking at the livestock position in the agroecological transition were the following. So the score on agroecology, or what we call the CAET, based on the 10 elements, is positively correlated with the diversity of animals on farm, the number of livestock units, and the score of animal welfare. There are moderate but still existing correlations between the number of livestock units and the added value per person, the nutritional diversity, and the agricultural biodiversity. And again, between animal diversity and uh, nutrition and youth employment as well. So more animal diversity on farm meant more options uh, for young people uh, to work in agriculture. Um, we were uh, looking for other links, but in this sample, so far, we haven't found a, a link between uh, livestock and soil health. Uh, we're still uh, in increasing the amount of data, and, and uh, we think that in the future we'll be able to find this relationship as well. So in terms of conclusions, uh, I think what I would like to, 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 to say is that the biggest challenges we see now, uh, and I think that this was mentioned before, is the, the inclusion of smallholders in the, in, in the livestock sector and the growth of the sector. And I think this is also the topic of today's discussion, but also climate change and biodiversity. The opportunities that we see is the role of animals uh, and farm animals in nutrition. It's getting more and more focus on the international scene. More and more studies are available. Uh, and animal source foods are very dense in a lot of missing micronutrients, not only in low and middle income countries, but also in high income countries. Uh, about a third of women, for example, in the United States or in, in, in the United Kingdom are anemic. So, so that means they don't have enough iron in their diets. And, and uh, the figures that have been uh, released recently by uh, the Alliance on Nutrition show very high level of uh, anemia in children and women across the world. Another opportunity is the Global Methane Pledge that was signed at COP26 in 2021. Uh, and through this pledge, more and more uh, donors are looking into livestock as a solution to climate change and not only a problem. And of course, I would like to mention One Health uh, because this is, this is uh, we're just out of a pandemic and, and we cannot ignore uh, the relationship between uh, animal health, environmental health, and human health. Uh, and the last point is that in order to go further in integrating all those dimensions and the challenges uh, for more sustainable uh, food systems, we need to uh, include also social uh, sustainability like gender and youth, governance and co-creation of solutions of knowledge of science with producers. Uh, and I think here uh, agroecology as an approach uh, is very useful. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for this very dense approach of the of the situation and giving us an outlook which is quite important uh, to to integrate many many different dimensions. Uh, we will now start uh, the the debate and the discussion, the more open discussion, and uh, I think we are going to have all the speakers visible now. Uh, yes, if uh, Pierre and um, uh, Pierre and Elizabeth can also come back. On, on screen, I don't see them now. I do not have them. Um, maybe I will I will address a few questions to 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 some of you, and then you we will see if you have additional uh, remarks. Maybe Pierre and Elizabeth. Th there has been a, a question about um, can the PSN. Can the PSN be a part of the solutions? Are they bringing some uh, some uh, good aspects? So the national strategic plans of the CAP, can they bring some uh, positive aspect for the transition? So maybe Pierre, if you want to start on this and uh, uh, maybe you can also stress on what would be for you the, the good, what, what is the most important things for the transition to a more sustainable uh, animal system and for peasant animal system. So Pierre, and then I will ask Elizabeth. Oui. Euh, <coughs> concernant les, les plans stratégiques, euh, moi je ne connais pas en détail les plans de tous les pays, mais euh, si je prends l'exemple de celui, France, celui euh, de la France, il ne va pas vers une transition réelle, il est plutôt dans la continuité, la continuité de, de ce qui se passe euh, actuellement euh, avec quelques quelques verdissements pour, pour notre part, notre analyse c'est celle-ci, euh, et on n'a pas, pas une augmentation du paiement qui a été cité tout à l'heure, paiement redistributif par exemple, par rapport à avant, il existe, mais il est très faible, 
le plafonnement, il n'y a pas de pla... réellement de plafonnement, donc euh, il n'y a pas de redistribution réelle vers les petites fermes, vers les petits élevages, euh, enfin les petites fermes en général, mais l'élevage en, part... en particulier. Euh, voilà, voilà ce que je peux en dire. Maintenant, moi, moi, ce que je pense qui est important, c'est euh, la question de... Le, le... Sur la question, la, ça serait le, de, de, de travailler à un plan de déspécialisation, c'est-à-dire remettre de l'élevage où il a disparu, parce que c'est, enfin, enfin, en tout cas, dans une certaine mesure, c'est parce que l'élevage, ça, ça, peut, ça, va, ça peut créer, ça fait des fertilisants, c'est aussi, ça permet des rotations, remettre en herbe, remettre en herbe les cultures, de, quand on, a, on fait toujours des cultures au même endroit, on est obligé d'utiliser beaucoup de produits chimiques parce qu'il y a des, des, des mauvaises herbes qui s'installent, tandis que si on fait des rotations avec des prairies pour nourrir les animaux, on, on, on permet de... de, de au sol, notamment de, moins, de, de se reposer un peu aussi, à, de, à beaucoup de mauvaises herbes de ne pas se développer quoi, sans utilisation de, de, de produits chimiques. Moi, je suis dans un système où je n'utilise pas, je, pas de label bio, mais je n'utilise plus de, 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 de désherbants et, plus de, et pas de, pratiquement plus d'engrais de synthèse. C'est quelque chose qui est assez facile en élevage tout en ayant, en continuant à avoir un un rendement correct. Donc, le, 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 moi, je dirais, le, le, la chose importante, c'est le, 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 la polyculture élevage, et remet, déspécialiser euh, et remettre de l'élevage où il n'y en a pas et diminuer la concentration, euh, les endroits où il y en a trop, parce que euh, bon, l'exemple de l'ouest de la France, où il y a des, des problèmes d'algues, de, de, par exemple, parce qu'il y, y a trop d'effluents d'élevage au même endroit, c est, c est, voilà, ça pourrait... Moi, je, voilà ce que je voulais dire. Merci. Elizabeth, uh, can you also comment on well, what you've heard and uh, what is the most important things for the transition? Can PSN uh, help or uh, what else? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so um, within the Italian plan, I'm not an expert, um, but within the Italian plan, the livestock sector was the, most, the biggest be uh, beneficent, uh, so he got the most attention. In, in the plan, but um, it is actually um, it was actually rather support for for the big industry. So for um, it is it is really difficult for um, for small scale livestock farmers to actually access. And uh, for example, for the ecological transition, um, there has been um, uh, support mainly for uh, bigger livestock farmers who, for example, uh, reduce their antibiotics use, but there has not been um, many other measures. Um, so, um, uh, yes, I um, we rather look skeptical on the on the PSN at the moment as small scale farmers and um, um, yes, yeah, so far would be important and then I will give the floor to Mr. Bercher because he, he has an answer he has also he wants to contribute and uh... thank you very much and it's also because unfortunately I have to leave but I really would like to thank you for for this great conference and the and the int uh, super interesting presentations I really appreciate them now I think we need to be very clear if we want to uh, support um, extensive livestock, how shall we do it? And now I hear, not necessarily in this conference, but every time there is a crisis with a big, with a big pig farm, with a big poultry farm, I have the impression this is the cup. But this is not the cup. Not a single poultry, not a single pig receives funding. We need to be clear on this once and forever. Our payments are direct payments related to land. So if people have land, then they get funding. If they have no land, they do not get funding. So all these huge farms that reference is made to, I'm not sure to what extent they are part of the common agricultural policy. There is an issue, I fully admit, what is the legal framework under which such enterprises or farms should work? And I've repeated it. 
there are now initiatives like the emission directive, like the animal welfare rules, which tries to address it. But to be clear, this is not a cap. We have services in the commission who are looking at these kind of things. Now, it is true that we pay investment aid. So there might be a discussion how far should we go for big farms in terms of investment aid. And if a crisis occurs, we, we do kind of private storage and these kind of things. But how many times did we do it in the last period for pigs? Almost never. So I think we need to be very honest to identify the problems, that there are problems, but they are not re necessarily related to the cap because our funding system, and in particular the direct payments, they are related to areas. Now, I have full sympathy for all of you who are telling me that livestock is not necessarily fairly uh, recompensated because they do not necessarily have big land, which is a fair point. But then we are back to the discussion, what else do we use to remunerate livestock farmers in an extensive manner. And then we have the agro-environmental scheme, we have the eco schemes, but for good reasons in the past, we have stopped paying per animal. So, so, so if I would like, if I have a question to you is, tell me how do we need to conceive funding systems that are simple, but fairer towards extensive livestock? And that's not an easy reply. I tell you, because if you look at all the elements in terms of simplicity, fairness, and all these things, it's not so easy. For the time being, we look at land because it's the easiest. You measure, you have a hectares, you have the payment. If you start to go back in the past, how many cows, how many cattle, all these things, all the, the fraud and all that things and the vulnerability which we have created in our systems, they were terrible. You might say you are bureaucrats, okay, it's fine for me. But in European Parliament and European Court of Auditors, they look at all these kind of things. So I think what is really important is that we reflect for the future, how can we have more targeted, fair funding schemes for something that you consider should be the future of agriculture. And that is my final play to you. To you. If you have good ideas in that respect, uh, please, uh, please uh, let us know. Thank you very much. I also realized that we will get the interesting slides and presentations and scientific articles, which uh, you have shared, and they will be hugely important because we are in this discussion now. We are discussing in these very days, what is the green claim? Which food products should be entitled to call themselves green? And there this discussion on life cycle uh, assessment comes in. But what do you say? What do you assess in the life cycle assessment? Some only assess the CO2 emissions. But is that the, is that the only criteria that should play a role in, in in terms of deciding what is green? So so there are really issues out there, and we have the holistic approach that uh, Anne Motte has has indicated to look at these things in a, in a more sophisticated manner is something that I am afraid we are still missing in this public debate. But thanks to your support and your uh, science, we will uh, be better uh, equipped to go for a good discussion. Thank you very much. And sorry, Pierre, that I called you Paul at the beginning. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mr. Buster. We, we understand that you have to leave, but we will continue the debate anyway. So now I will continue with some yeah. uh, a round of questions, of comment from the different people because we are arriving at the end of our discussion. So maybe um, uh, there has been this discussion about payment, area payment, so to Pablo Manzano, and there is also, you have mentioned in your discussion, the, the, the kind of competition maybe with some other use of uh, grassland for um, planting woods. And this leads us to the question of carbon market and, and 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 so on. Uh, do do you and and there has been a question I've seen about would could could also be um, uh, agrivoltaism or uh, the, the the plantation of uh, uh, the agrivoltaism uh, la, la, the pan, uh, photovoltaic uh, installations. Yes, exactly. Could could it be a solution for uh, animal farming? So briefly, can you comment on this? 
Well, that's interesting because livestock sometimes has to be used as a cheaper way or can be used as grazing livestock can be as a cheaper way to sustain, like, for example, the, the photovoltaic fields cannot have a too large vegetation because otherwise they will shadow on uh, on the on the panels. And uh, sometimes it's also used to maintain infrastructures such as electric lines where the trees cannot touch on, on the grid or or even uh, gas adducts and gas colonizations where the roads may damage uh, these these um, these infrastructures so definitely livestock can be of use on on these things and it highlights the need for for this this uh, sustaining such uh, open landscapes open ecosystems that i was talking about but also um, regarding something that pierre mentioned before i think i omitted to say that saying that the planetary boundaries for livestock are okay and that we are safe within them because we are at the same level of herbivory that is natural doesn't mean that we are doing right with the current livestock system and i think that's important and that's something that we have reflected in this paper in in uh, npg biodiversity because we can observe also that in western europe for example in spain there is too much monogastrics compared to the to the natural baseline or in in england for example where they have a lot of fertilized pastures and this fertilization comes also from fossil fuels from uh, from nitrogen that has been fixed using using oil they also have too many ruminants because they have too much sheep uh, however when we enlarge the scale and we see how much herbivores they should be in Europe and how much there are it's pretty much match it so it indicates us that we have areas that are being severely undergrazed and this brings a lot of problems and we have these uh, these interests um like uh, mentioning the the wood plantations that are also disregarding that uh, rangelands and grasslands can host a lot of carbon can store a lot of carbon underground and uh, that it is safer than in forest and in woody vegetation because it will not burn if um, if a fire comes. And this again is not being taken into account. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Mote. I know you have to leave, so uh, please, I give you the floor for a, a kind of final comment. And I also ask to all the participants maybe to send us their their presentation so it can be shared with people who would like to see it. Uh, later. So thank you, Madame Motet. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have much to add. I'm, I really like the, the, the question on, on how we need to optimize uh, the surface we have. Uh, I think in Europe, we, we, we have a different trend compared to other parts of the world with natural reforestation, land abandonment, uh, and, and, and to some extent also losses of biodiversity linked to, to this abandonment of land in, in uh, for example, in mountain areas. Uh, so so the, the, the optimum use of an hectare of land is, is really what we should look at, and we have more and more information to do that. So in some places, uh, this optimum, it, it has to be a compromise between nutrition and environmental impact. Uh, we need to get the uh, highest amount of nutrition uh, from with the minimum uh, environment, environmental impact. And this is this cannot be the same solution uh, everywhere. It has to be really tailored to uh, different the different uh, agroecosystems that we work with, uh, and and it's very complex. That's why that's why it's it's a difficult task. But I think it's 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 the only it's the only way forward to look into this optimum use of land. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I will then end with Stanka. Stanka, if you want a, a kind of a final remark, I've seen on the on the on the discussion uh, a remark that the cap was not only about subsidies but also about market regulations. And you've you've talked about uh, trade trade issues. So maybe a word on uh, coherence of policies. What do you what do you think is uh, the good future? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Genevieve. I mean, the, the, the list of recommendations you have is very long and so is ours as well. So uh, over the last few years, we've been working on, on this issue. We found no silver bullet for, for fixing all the different problems because there are, so, there are so many and they need to be addressed by different measures. So definitely, I mean, one of our clear statements um, is that there, there is also a need for market regulation. And if we look at the Mercosur trade agreement, which is, um, 
being discussed to be ratified this year possibly, then this could be one first step to actually limit um, the expansion of, um, of trade at the moment and then rethink, of course, um, how the, the whole system is working. But I just wanted to thank you as well for, for the invitation here and um, listening to what the European Commission said, um, that they are accepting the fact that there are different models of, of livestock production um, and that you as a, a sustainable small scale peasant farmers movement have actually the solutions um, it's kind of an invitation, but also like um, a confirmation from our side that we can work together with you to identify who are, which are these, um, the sustainable farmers, sustainable farms that we want to support, and then maybe work together to, um, to put forward a, a, a very concrete proposition for the next CAP reform, because, um, okay, if it's not direct payments and pig farms are not receiving um, direct payments, what exactly should this, uh, this support look like? So I hope that the European Commission will be open to receive recommendations and solutions from our side, which are based on the actual needs of those who need um, the support and who have shown that um, they have the solutions on their side. So um, on this kind of positive note, um, I hope we can continue the collaboration in this exchange into looking at what are the actual, the actual solutions and, and what political support is needed. and. Hopefully, um, as I said, um, the European Union national governments will be open to support this kind of um, uh, production models. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I will not try a conclusion as we are really running out of time and we've uh, come to, to the end of, of this uh, webinar. Um, what, I, what I can uh, stress is that the, the importance uh, that uh, sustainability has got three dimensions, and it's uh, economic, it is social, and it is also environmental. So it is important to 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 see uh, these three aspects, and uh, that we have we have um, we are happy that we have contributed to the debate and to to continue to contribute to this debate about how to improve our uh, well sustainability that is to give a future to to uh, animal farmers, but also to um, people in general. Uh, we will continue the debate on many other topics in different uh, places and different uh, occasions. And uh, one next um, meeting will be on the 7th of uh, March, where we are organizing uh, what we call the high level uh, event, but where we will present ECVC vision on different topics, but on agriculture, on but on, on not only on animal production, but different issues. So we'll be happy to 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 welcome uh, all participants uh, in this in this debate. I would like also to thank the interpreters who have uh, been translating during all the discussion uh, the the different uh, speakers. And uh, I don't know if. Um, co-organizers have something to say before we close this webinar but thank you thank you very much for all participants anyway and uh, uh, to my colleague Elizabeth and Pierre uh, that was great to have you and I hope you're doing fine where you are so thank you very much and uh, there will be those presentations on our site so you can uh, see this debate again so again thank you so goodbye. Au revoir. Au revoir. Alors, euh, hop. Au revoir.